Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Zen and the Art of SolidWorks Surfacing, presented by the Demani Group. My name is Andrew Lowe. I'm a senior industrial designer. I've been using SolidWorks for almost 15 years now. Do rough surfaces have you on edge? Got a kink in your spline? Zen out and come to really understand how SolidWorks surfacing works. Using advanced techniques, I'll demonstrate surface modeling workflows that allow you to quickly and easily create the most challenging of shapes. Located just outside Chicago, Illinois, the Demonic Group is a full-service product development consultancy offering industrial design, design engineering, electrical engineering, and software development services. Welcome to another installment of Zen and the Art of SolidWorks Surfacing. In this installment, we'll be taking a look at the different surface features and explaining what they do and when is the best time to use them. We'll be building on all these surface features in later videos, so if you're already familiar with them, you might want to skip this one, but if you're new to surfacing, then stick around. First up is the surface extrude. So the surface extrude works the same as a solid extrude. You have a sketch profile and you can extrude it in a certain direction. They're critical for creating reference geometry to use to define the shape of more complicated surfaces. So I find that uh, the reference surfaces have two major functions. The first is when creating drafted parts. So plastic parts or cast parts that need to have draft as they meet the parting line. We can use the, uh, the draft reference surface to make surfaces that uh, end at the parting line tangent to this draft reference surface such they have the right amount of draft. In order to do that we need to turn on this little draft feature here such that the uh, surface has built in draft. Note that the, uh, the preview on this isn't always accurate especially on spline shapes. Uh, you can see here the preview doesn't match the spline, but don't worry about the preview when you actually extrude the feature. It will line up with your sketch entity. They're also useful for creating tangency reference surfaces. So a lot of the time you'll be creating something that's symmetrical. There's no point in trying to accurately model both halves with unique features. It's much easier to just model one half of it and then use the mirror body command at the end to mirror it. However, to ensure that there's no uh, spike or dip at that uh, mirror plane, we need to make sure that all of the surfaces uh, are made tangent to our tangency reference surface such that when mirroring is performed, we don't have any issues at that mirror plane. So the boundary surface is the workhorse of surface modeling, at least my workflow, in SOLIDWORKS. So it generates new surfaces from a selection of profiles in either one or two directions. It supports both G1 tangency and G2 equal curvature continuity in both directions. The best practice is always to create boundary surfaces that have four sides. So three-sided boundary surfaces can introduce a degenerate point, and this can cause issues with filleting, and it especially causes issues with, uh, with shell. So we want to try and build four-sided boundary surfaces wherever possible. So this is the first way of creating a boundary surface. I kind of call it a swept boundary surface, and it's created from a profile or one profile in each direction. The blue line here is the profile in direction one. The purple line is the profile in direction two, and you kind of see that this profile sweeps along. So there's only two profiles here, but we end up getting a four-sided surface so that we don't run into that degenerate point. The second example of using the boundary surface is an enclosed boundary surface created from a four-sided perimeter. This four-sided perimeter could be made of sketch entities, it could be made from curves or reference geometry, or it could also be made from uh, existing model edges, whether it be surface or solid edges. So here in direction one, I have this model edge and this model edge, and in direction two, I have this model edge and this model edge. And I've also set the curvature to face, the G2 connection, in this direction such that we create this nice kind of manual blended uh, fillet shape between these different uh, surfaces. When using the boundary surface, you have the option of modifying what's referred to as the connector between existing model edges. So this surface I'm creating has one profile in direction one, but two profiles in direction two between this edge and this edge. Note that this edge is much longer here, so what I've done is grab this little dot here that called the connector, and I've dragged it up to create a short edge boundary surface. And so this is a useful way to adjust the start and end of the profile such that uh, you know you can create you better shape your surfaces, and instead of having to put a split line or, or a 3D sketch and drag the, the back. And the one thing to note is that uh, these aren't necessarily entirely parametric. So if you are making model edges and you have one of these boundary surfaces with a drag back connector, you might, you might want to go in after making that, uh, that model edit and make sure the connector is where you want it to be. 
The other uh, option with the boundary surface is very powerful is the trimmed boundary surface where the profiles in one direction extend past the profiles used. So in this boundary surface, I have one profile in direction one and a second profile in direction one back here. Note that the model edges in direction two are much longer than what we're actually using. You can see they have the, the, the kind of the entire perimeter, but I didn't want to build the boundary surface between that because in this shape, there needs to be a lot more surfacing happening in this area here, which we'll cover in a later video. So what you can do is turn on trim by direction one, because this is a profile in direction one, and then this will, SolidWorks will just ignore this part of the profile that's no longer used. So this is a really powerful option that's not found in the surface loft. Just a, another reason why I prefer the boundary over the surface loft. So the boundary surface supports both G1 and G2 in both directions. This is an example with curvature to face G2 in direction one. Sometimes you'll get this pop-up, uh, the guide or profile curves curvature at its endpoints does not match the curvature of the surface it touches. I find that even if there's a very, very minuscule mismatch on the order of 0.001 degrees, you still might get this pop-up message. I just always hit OK and it can be ignored. One of the options when working with the boundary surface is the tangent influence uh, slider. And so if you have profiles in both direction one and direction two, you sometimes have access to the tangent influence slider. And what this does is it gives more preference to the shape of the profiles in one direction than the other. So here I have a surface that's being made tangent to a uh, reference surface here. And if you examine the curvature combs, you can see a little bit of a dip here. And so by increasing the tangent slider to 100%, it kind of inflates the, the shape of the surface here and gives more pro or preference to this profile here. Very important when creating mirror shapes. If I hadn't increased the, uh, the tangent influence, I might have seen an actual uh, visual kind of dip at when this part was actually mirrored. So it's always important to uh, check the built-in curvature combs and increase the tangent influence slider to 100% where required. So the surface fill is one of the most powerful features in SOLIDWORKS. Surface fill has the ability to create a patch with n number sided surface edges. That is a surface with as many edges as required. It's great for creating three-sided surfaces instead of using the boundary to a certain point, which creates that degenerate point, which we want to avoid. And it's also great for five plus sided patches here. So in this situation to create this surface here, what the surface fill is actually doing is building a larger four sided surface and trimming it back. Uh, this is an older screenshot from SOLIDWORKS 2014. In newer versions, they took away what was referred to as the grid preview, this kind of yellow preview showing you what the underlying four sided surface was looking like. Uh, so one thing to note is to always turn off optimized surface when using surface fill. If you leave it on, it will actually just generate a surface loft without telling you that. By turning it off, it uh, uses a different set of, of math and of algorithms to create that overbuilt four-sided surface and trims it back to fit the profile. So the surface fill supports both G0, G1, and G2 conditions in all directions. However, you may think that you, just because you want to create a curvature continuous surface fill that you want to set curvature to all edges. But the best practice I find is to first set tangency on all edges and then add curvature as required. In this example with curvature set on all the profiles, we actually get these weird lumpy shapes here. Not a good looking surface fill. Whereas tangency on all edges actually gives us exactly what we're looking for. I'm often asked the question, when should I use boundary surface and when should I use surface fill? Well, an easy way to imagine this is visualize the outline of the patch you're trying to create as a frame with a rectangular tarp stretched over. The tarp can be any shape and size, but it always has to start with four sides. So here, if we were to use the boundary surface to create this profile between these two green sections here, the four-sided tarp would get really scrunched up and bunched in this corner. And that's the degenerate point we're referring to that causes issue with uh, shells, surface offsets, and sometimes filleting. And this is the boundary surface example. If we were to use the uh, surface fill, what the surface fill is kind of doing is we're draping this large four-sided tarp over and then kind of trimming the tarp after the fact. So the flow of the surface is, is very different. Here we can see that the flow of the surface gets scrunched up at that degenerate point, whereas with the surface fill, it's much more relaxed because this is the four-sided shape. The flow is much different. It's not getting bunched up in the corner, and then it's being trimmed back to fit our two-sided profile. Here's another example of that. 
When the surface needs to be created is four-sided, such as this patch here between these four profiles, boundary surface is the way to go. The profile of the actual kind of underlying math of the surface follows the, the shape. It is very logical. The flow makes a lot of sense. Whereas if you have a larger kind of shape that's inherently not four-sided, two, three, or five-sided, surface fill is much better due to its ability to create that larger four-sided surface and trim it back. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this installment of Zen and the Art of SolidWorks Surfacing. Be sure to check out the example SolidWorks files on the Demonic Group website linked in the description below. And don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Happy SolidWorks Surfacing!